Welcome back to Tutorials with Adobe After Effects. This one's going to be about rotoscoping. Now I've done some rotoscoping tutorials uh, before using the tools you have just inside After Effects and I want to do something a little bit different this time because there are actually some uh, more professional level and uh, kind of some um, higher level tools that you can use for something like this. So for uh, true rotoscoping programs, they have the idea of you're animating the vector shapes like the masks in After Effects, but also rotoscoping really is that combined with the idea of tracking. And that's what we want to do here. There's a program called Mocha Pro, which is its own standalone program. Uh, I've used it professionally and it's uh, pretty good. But here in After Effects, you have another version of it. So if I'm in uh, my After Effects and I've got this uh, footage here ready to roto, I'm going to go up to animation. Oh, let's click on our layer. There we go. Go up to animation and do track in Boris FX Mocha. Now this is a bit new. We've known it in the past as Mocha AE. So it's the same type of thing. We just have some uh, different, uh, different names here. Maybe the company really wants to tell us uh, about the ownership. So you have Mocha AE, which is, uh, as I mentioned, a lightweight version of a standalone program called Mocha Pro. That does a whole lot more, but Mocha AE is uh, a really good one, and it can do quite a lot that'll help us do some roto. So let's jump into that. Just by clicking this Mocha button, that says Launch Mocha AE, and it pops up here as a, uh, a separate window. It's like it's its own little program. It's a free plugin in After Effects, so it's pretty nice. So we're going to turn this off and uh, just start this. Okay, so this is the program. You see it floats atop of um, our uh, After Effects interface. And it's got a few things going on. It's a little bit different. So we're going to try, um, uh, try to see what we can do with this here. Now, when you open your, yours up, it might open up to Essentials. So I'm going to change that um, workspace to Essentials, and we'll start with that. We can take a look at some of these uh, others later on, especially Roto. So this is Essentials. Now, what I want to say here initially is that navigating around here and using keyboard shortcuts, which is really important to graphic design work, is a bit different because this is not an Adobe program. Now, you can change the, sh the keyboard shortcuts, but I would suggest trying to get used to the way that um, Mocha AE does it, because if you're using professional level compositing, animation, roto software, whatever, you're going to be doing things that aren't Adobe, and they will be um, using their own kind of different way of doing things. And this is a nice little introduction to doing things in a different way, using a different set of, of um, keyboard shortcuts and navigating around the interface. So let me show you what I mean by that. So to zoom in or out, which you're going to want to do, you're going to hold the Z key on the keyboard, and you can see this little magnifying glass. So you scroll up and you zoom in. Hold down the X and you get a hand and you can pan around like that. Hold down the Z and uh, drag down and you can scroll out. Or uh, zoom out, I mean. So those are kind of the main ones right there that you really want to, uh, to get to know. Um, bit different from how you do it in Adobe things, but the keys are right next to each other and it's pretty easy to get. Now something else I want to show you is um, how to navigate the, the timeline here because it's a little bit different. Uh, one thing that is about the same is if you hit the space bar, it'll play. So you can see it plays through here and it actually will play your video footage at a better and faster rate than After Effects does. Space bar again and it'll stop. You've got um, some keys here for playing forward, stop, playing backward, stop, oh, there we go, stop, and then back one frame, forward one frame. Now you also might want to be able to know keyboard shortcuts for this, so you don't have to always move down here. And that's going to be the command key, or I imagine the control key on a PC, and the right arrow. That will take you step by step one uh, frame uh, through, uh, through the timeline. The left arrow will take you backwards. And if you had keyframes, we don't have any keyframes yet, you can see that we've got some keys here for that, but you can do the command key or control 
and then up or down. Up will take you forward to the next keyframe, and then um, down will take you back to the next keyframe. So let's just kind of you know go through here a little bit. Um, you're going to want to navigate through this pretty easily, and um, at some point we need to start rotoing. So the roto tools are right here, and you're going to start by making shapes with uh, these tools here. So we have um, spline tools, and then we have uh, rectangular and elliptical, uh, and they say um, layers. And that's the interesting thing here in Mocha, is that every roto shape is its own layer. It's called a layer, and it will stack up here in this layers area. So if you click and hold on this X spline tool, you'll see X spline and then Bezier spline. So the Bezier uh, spline here is going to make um, curves with Bezier handles very much like you used to with the pen tool. But most professional roto programs, while they'll include a tool like this, they'll have what it might be better tools for roto. In this case, we're going to make an X spline right here. And so um, I've just got that, so it looks okay and I'm going to um, click to start making a shape. We'll start here with this uh, table and I'll just kind of click and 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 you can see it's making this uh, shape with kind of sort of um, automatic um, rounded corners. Now when you're done making your shape, you're going to right click and that closes it off. So there's your closed roto shape. And you can see right here, it's given me a, um, a layer, and that's layer one. I can double click on the name and rename it. So table. Okay, we got that. Uh, great. So we got it, um, layer one, and um, let's get uh, working on building this roto shape. So I'll zoom in, hold down the Z key, and scroll up. And just like before, as I've mentioned with rotoing, you want to make an accurate shape here. And we're going to take this to this line. Oddly enough, unlike with, um, with say, the pen tool or, or Bezier shapes, uh, it doesn't really matter if you use a lot of points here. I talk about using as few points as possible to make, uh, to make um, paths with the pen tool. But when you're using these types of spline tools, um, it's okay to use extra points. It really is all right. Let's we'll kind of pull these down a bit here. And just as usual, all your, your normal things about, about working with roto shapes will apply. So I'm trying to roto here to the, the um, last opaque pixel. All right, so there we go. So I've, I've built this shape here. Looks like it's pretty good. Um, I don't know if this one might need to come down a little bit there. Um, even things that you might think are perfectly straight lines in real life almost never are. And so having a few points here helps me get this table to be a bit more accurate. Okay, so it uh, looks okay. I'm going to zoom out so that I can see this uh, whole thing here. There we go. So we've built the roto shape. Uh, so far, so good. And you can see that what it's done when I built that is that it put a keyframe. That little green um, triangle there, a little flag, is a keyframe. So unlike using the uh, mask tools in uh, After Effects, this is going to give you automatic keyframing. You don't have to hit a stopwatch and turn, on, turn it on or off. It knows you're going to want a keyframe. So the real true power here is going to be with tracking. We want to be able to uh, track this and that will um, do a lot of the work for us that we don't need to do. Um, I'm not going to try and keyframe this manually and, and try and make it move along here, but I'm going to see what tracking can do. And here are the tracking controls uh, right over here. Now here are the tracking controls. So by default you have these options turned on. We have translate, which is just move, scale, rotate, and skew. So for most standard rotoscoping operations, you probably want to keep these on. And we have some uh, buttons here. There's a track backward, a stop, and a track forward. Now since I ended up here, right here in the middle, I'm on frame 146, I've got to track both directions. 
And it's okay to start in the middle or the end or the beginning. That's why they have track forward and backward. And I was wanting to just run through the footage and see what it looked like. So since I'm right here, I'm going to come over here and uh, click this button to start tracking backwards. There we go. And what it's going to do is it's going to translate, scale, rotate, and skew my initial shape so that it um, tries to match what's, uh, what's going on in the footage. And so because this is not a locked off shot, there's some camera movement, we're going to see everything is going to move here in, in this footage. So as we're looking at this, you can see it's going backwards, going nice and, <laughs> nice and slow here. But we're, we're tracking back here to the beginning, and I think you can see that it's kind of following along and trying to keep up with this you know, little camera movement. And sometimes those little tiny movements can be the most difficult thing to, um, to roto. Big, huge movements uh, are easier. So we're going to let this just go to the end here and, uh, and see what it does. And it should stop when it reaches this first frame. And exciting. So we can see it's changed the color here. It says this part of the footage is tracked. And so I've got a keyframe where I started and I'm right now here at the beginning. So what you want to do is you want to come in and see how, um, how accurate it is to the, the, um, the item that you're trying to roto. So we'll zoom in here, again that's the zoom key, and the X to kind of scroll over here. And so as I'm looking at this, um, I'm thinking, well, that might be a little bit too close to the edge, so I'm just gonna start pulling this down a little bit there. And that's pretty good. Notice that when I did that, it automatically made a keyframe. There's the keyframe um, symbol, and there's the keyframe symbol right there. You don't have to do anything like you do in After Effects, like, uh, like turning on um, that little stopwatch to start keyframing. Key this knows this is what you want to do, so it's keyframing automatically. And I'm going to have to turn, uh, take that down right there. And I'll pull that one down again, last opaque pixel, and kind of like that. Okay, so I think that should, that should do it. Um, zoom out a bit, and then what I can do is I can do my command uh, or control, and then um, the right arrow key, and I can just go through the footage, and I want to see how it looks there. And just so you know, you can also do the same key, um, command, and then up will go to the next keyframe, and then down arrow will go to the first keyframe, kind of back and forth that way. And so that's how you're going to um, be navigating um, along the timeline here in, um, in Mocha. So let me zoom in, and just like we talked about before uh, in, in uh, other uh, tutorials about rotoscoping, really what you want to do is you want to look and see um, where there's a big um, change or a big difference, and um, you want to put a keyframe in there and pull that shape back. And so what we're hoping here is that the tracking, and this one looks a little bit off, let me just uh, move this down a bit. Notice that just like um, uh, in After Effects, there's a bounding box, and so I can, with a bounding box, I can actually scale, uh, translate, or rotate the entire shape. So I'll just come down here and I'll just pull that down just a little bit there, yeah, just just a tiny bit, and you can see that automatically it's making a new keyframe for me. And let me quickly pan over here to this side and see that, and maybe I'll kind of pull some of these back up. Um, a little bit there, and this little one up here, kind of like that. All right, so I'll just kind of keep going forward. So you see it adds an automatic keyframe, and um, what I'm hoping, that went up a bit uh, too much there, so I'm going to pull that back down. There we go. So what I'm hoping here is that the tracking is um, taking care of a lot of the animation that I would have to do myself and so I don't want to have to do it by hand. So um, you can see I should have to really end up with a lot fewer keyframes. And this motion is pretty good. Notice how it's going up and down and kind of rotating with that. So um, 
Otherwise, I would have to be doing a lot of keyframes in After Effects to get it to follow along here. But the tracking has done it uh, a good bit of animation for me. And that's the idea, so that, that um, true rotoscoping is the combination of tracking and uh, animating your, your roto shapes here. So um, now that I've come to here, I'm going to say, well, this part here looks like it's pretty well rotoed. We need to roto the rest of this. So now I can click uh, this track button and track it forward uh, right here. So let me just do that. Um, you can also just, just to kind of look at a few of these controls here, link to track table. I've only got one layer and um, that's uh, really all we need to, to do at, the, at this moment. I've got the one layer and I'll just kind of click on here so it can be doing this while I'm talking. So anyway, I'm tracking forward and you can see that happening right there. Uh, link to track says table. So I've just got the one layer and it's tracking um, that roto shape with these options that I have selected. And so that's kind of really all I have to worry about at this point. You just kind of have it um, go through and do its thing. So for people that have kind of um, asked about um, about um, After Effects and, and having a mask, you know, can you, it'd be cool if you could, you could um, track a mask and that would help you with rotoscoping. Well, you can actually track a mask in After Effects. Uh, you can make a really simple mask and then go to your tracking and you'll see that option to track that mask and it'll do something similar to what I'm doing here. But what it'll do is it'll actually add in After Effects a keyframe for every frame. And that makes it practically impossible to go in and fine tune it, right? So we're not keyframing this yet. It's the, it has the tracking data applied first. And then I'm going back and keyframing. But if I were tracking a mask in After Effects, I would see a keyframe here for every frame. And then what that means is if I make one little change here, now all these other keyframes leading to it are wrong. And you'd have to kind of fi uh, minutely and fine tune every one leading up to that. And I'm gonna guess that's humanly impossible to do. So anyway, this is why the tracking in Mocha is a much better way to go. And uh, something else that I might like to point out is that I'm just letting this run and go to the end. I could stop it at any time. And I'm seeing here that this, um, this uh, rotor shape is off. It's a bit off right there and not keeping up with the table. And so there are two ways to, to approach this. One is you could stop it, adjust it down, make a keyframe, and then keep tracking. Or you could track to the end of it and then start keyframing and fixing it. And either one, you know, really is an okay way to go. So I'm at the end now, and I can see it is a bit off here. So now I'm going to start keyframing again. But what this tells me here, this sort of this um, bluish, light blue, purple line here across my timeline is that it has now all been tracked. So if I zoom in, there we go. I can take this whole thing. And again, uh, if you put it in the corner, it's kind of hard to get sometimes, but there we go. See, I can rotate the whole, um, the whole shape or I can um, move it, translate it, or come to one of these middle corners and I can scale it. So just like you can with the bounding box in After Effects. So I'm just gonna move the whole thing down. So right about here, I'm gonna move that down and so it's matching up pretty well there. So if I go across here, it's not quite matching up, which to me means I need to rotate it somewhat. So even though it was trying to rotate uh, for tracking purposes, it didn't, uh, didn't quite get it. So if I go over here, I can rotate that. I'm trying to kind of rotate that in position. There we go. And just uh, as I've mentioned before in rotoscoping, you want to really try and do the, the, the big movements first um, with your rotor shapes. Try um, working with um, uh, scale and position and rotation before you go in and start you know, fine tuning individual points. And you can actually get things pretty close um, by using these overall macro or gross adjustments before you go in doing the fine adjustments. So I'm gonna take that to about there and say that that's good. So again, I've got a, a keyframe here. And so now I'll just um, hit my command key and do the left arrow key and start kind of coming back. And you can see it's moving along pretty well with, with the overall movement of the camera, that little kind of handheld camera shape going on. 
think maybe here I'm just going to pull that down just a little bit. Right there. You can see it makes a keyframe automatically. I'm going to come over here to my other side and see how that looks. And see it's a little bit off there, so let me kind of pull that point up to there. And uh, there we go. So I'm trying to do as you know little keyframing as possible and let the track take care of, of all this stuff here. And so I hope this is um, not extremely boring, but this is the process. You know, if, if you do roto work and you do a decent amount of it, your brain kind of has to work at a bit of a, a slower pace as you're doing this type of stuff here. Okay, so right here, I think I should move that down just a little bit. Again, I don't want to get too far off here where these pixels are, are, are not that opaque. Maybe pull things up there and come across here. And this is, this is your, your fine tuning that you're doing as you're rotoing uh, to kind of help things, um, help things uh, be accurate. Uh, and of course also consistent, what we're looking for is consistent movement, which is really even better than 100% accurate movement. So I'm just gonna kind of uh, zip on back here to my uh, initial keyframe, which is right here, and see how that looks. So I'm thinking overall it's pretty good. And I've got a few keyframes spread across here, but notice it's just, it's just not that many compared to how much it would be if I was doing this all completely in, um, in After Effects. Uh, that camera kind of going up and down and wobbling and all that would really, um, uh, really need a lot of keyframes. So because uh, rotoscoping is such a, a, a time intensive process, we're looking for any tools that we have that can help us um, you know, shorten that and yet still be accurate. So I think I can call this uh, layer done, the table layer. Now that can be fine. So zoom out and um, We'll just uh, hold down uh, Z and click. There we go. Okay, and zoom out just a little bit more so I can see my edges. Great. So um, there we go. I mean, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine keyframes. You'd have just incredibly uh, larger amount more in um, in After Effects. So that's my one shape, and just like any type of rotoing exercise, you would be making separate roto shapes for your different moving parts. And so I want to show about that a little bit here. So I'm going to um, do my command and go down, 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 and uh, start my first frame here. And let's make a roto shape for the, um, the arm, this upper arm right here, and uh, talk a bit about what happens when you have more than one shape here. Now, if you look at this layer, it has this little gear, which actually means process. And what that means is that as I track, it's going to be processing or tracking that. But once you're done, you don't want to track that anymore. I mean, you, you, you're, you're fine there. So you can uh, click that button, turn it off, and now it's not going to track this shape. You know, the animation is, is still there. It's all, you know, baked in, but it's not going to track it again. And you don't want to retrack something that's already done because it might mess it up. Let's just make a new shape here and I'll get my X spline and start here with the, this uh, upper arm and shoulder, uh, you know, whatever, whatever we're going to end up calling it. A little bit here. Always want to be as close as you can. There we go. And again, start making shapes. And I want to talk about uh, the X spline here, because in many ways it's different than Bezier curves and things uh, like that. Uh, often when I talk about um, using and making uh, Bezier curves, I talk about using as few points as possible, and that will allow you to have more control and get nice, smooth, um, uh, really consistent, accurate curves. Using these other spline tools, like a B spline or an X spline, it's kind of just the opposite. It's not a problem having too many points. And uh, let's take a look at these and see how they work here. I'm going to zoom in a bit more, and uh, so I can look at my pixels here at the very edge, and just kind of start editing. So I'm going to move this up and come to that last opaque pixel. 
which means something like this, that's a bit too far out. Let me pull that back in. So these are just by their own nature, by default, they're gonna try and make curvy, um, curvy lines and not straight lines. And these little handles here are kind of interesting because that's what kind of adjusts the curve. If I pull this straight up, now I've got one that's kind of a point. But if I push this handle in, now I can kind of curve that line in. So that red line there, again, that's the curve. So if I wanted to, um, to change this, I could, um, you know, double click on that and we could call this, um, you know, uh, let's see, um, uh, L arm, there we go. I can even change this color. Let's make it something like, uh, we could do that. All right, and so there's that line there. And that's a good way to sort of distinguish um, one, uh, one uh, layer or one um, rotor shape from another. So you're kind of coming along here and fine tuning these points here. I just want to move these down so they remain curvy. So you can see that's catching that background. That'd be a bad, uh, a bad bit of roto there. But if I can pull that or push that um, handle in, notice how now it goes in where I want it to go. And if there's any adjustment that you need to do, like maybe I need to pull this one out here and pull that one down, push that down a bit. So you can see how you know we're making curves and the more there's a bit of an angle there, the more that adjusts that curve, right? So you're almost never gonna have something like that in true roto, always like a little bit of curve, even the things that are kind of sharply cornered. Uh, because when you, when you jump in and you look at it on this level, you can really see that things just aren't that straight and sharp and pointy. They tend to be kind of kind of curvy. So let's just kind of fine tune uh, this line right here. There we go. And I'll kind of pull that one in sort of like that. All right, and so now I've got another roto shape. Well, um, that's all good here. I should probably maybe pull this one in a little bit so it's not sticking out there so much. Okay, so we'll zoom out here and um, there's my second roto shape. Hopefully you can see how the um, how the um, handles here kind of control those curves. If you're really used to the pen tool, this is a bit different, but in some ways it, it, it's it's more direct and, and, and working and, and you've got these handles visible and that's, uh, you know, all the time you can grab those, move those around. So you're gonna have really shapes like this for if we're doing roto, that's, that's what it's going to be. So, um, you know, it's all looking good. If I think this, this shape is good, and what you want is you wanna have, again, for this first keyframe, um, I want um, the shape to be as accurate as possible. Looking around here, pull that in a little bit more. I want it to be as accurate and possible so it has the best uh, starting uh, position here, and then I can start tracking. And I can't track back because this is on the first frame, so I'll just track forward. And there we go. Again, it's going to be doing translation, scale, rotate, and skew. And, um, you know, following along here, I'm seeing it sort of drift off so I can stop the track. There we go. So I, so I stopped it. And just going to show you the idea here that um, I can try and fix it before I continue tracking along. So let me zoom in a bit here. And um, just think, gosh, how can I fix this? Well, I could scale it up a little bit. Okay, that's pretty good. And then it looks like I might need to rotate, rotate a little bit there, okay. And now I can take and sort of scale it in. Um, like I'm trying to do all of this with um, my, my macro adjustments first before I really get into kind of doing point editing. So we'll kind of go like that, pull this like here, okay. So I think probably at this point, I need to go in and just uh, adjust the points. So zoom in and kind of move that up there, move that one, adjust that one. And again, I'm trying not to follow every little bump and curve, but really keep just kind of more of a, of a consistent uh, shape. Something you can do as well is you can select multiple points. So if I sort of click and drag here, it's much easier to do this in Mocha than it is in After Effects. Now I select these three points, they have their own bounding box. So I can move them as one. Um, I can even rotate, see, rotate those three points there uh, like that. And Command-Z 
for or control Z for undo, that still is the same. So that's nice. So anyway, um, uh, if you select uh, just a few points here, now you can uh, work with just those. And so instead of moving them individually, I'm trying to adjust them as though they were their own separate little shape there. And um, again, I'm trying to keep things in the same place, not let them slide and move around. That's a problem with Roto if they slide around uh, too much. So that's pretty good. I'm going to come down here and see this one kind of slid off. So I'll pull that down to get this edge of the arm. Okay, because that's a little shape. That's a little hole right there. If something was behind, I'd want to, you know, keep that uh, that space open. So let me zoom out here, and I'm guessing this is pretty good. Now I'll continue tracking from here. There's my track button, and we'll track forward, and keep going that way. So um, I'm not going to do all of this in real time, but the idea here is to show you that you've got, um, you know, this is how you're starting off. Oh, here it is changing quite a bit. Let me stop that. Okay. So um, with something that moves quite a bit, like for example, the table didn't move a whole lot. And so I could track all the way and then come back and, and, and put a few keyframes in. But this arm is, is moving and rotating and, and, and it's, it's changing its orientation and it's, the actual shape itself is changing. Uh, so the, um, the tracker really isn't able to, to catch all of that. So it might be better for something like this to actually stop the track midway and try and make these adjustments as it's going along before it gets too far off. See, so that's kind of what I'm doing here. I'm trying to, uh, with positioning and rotate and scale, I'm trying to kind of adjust this and fix this track as it's going along. Okay, so that looks pretty good. I think that one needs to be pulled in there. There we go. And so once again, I'll zoom in and try and adjust these, these points to get them where they need to be. If I pull some way out here, remember I can always pull this handle in and try and kind of push that curve away. So with these right here, that one kind of might go there, that one there, that one I'll pull down. I'm not really thinking about the hair at the moment. That's a, a whole different issue. But see, as I pull this point up, I can push this handle down to kind of give that more of a curve. Okay, so see now this is looking a little bit better. It's, uh, it's more accurate. And now I'll continue tracking. So if something that moves a lot and changes shape a lot, this is a process you might want to go through. And it's always a bit of a judgment call. Do you track it all the way and then keyframe it? Or do you kind of stop and pause and keyframe along the way? So you'll kind of have to make your own decision there. And, oh, okay, stop this. So now I have something where it's kind of gotten a little bit confused with this hand moving in. And it, tried, it looks like it tried to move in with the hand. And I would need, of course, to make a separate shape, uh, like a, a rotor shape for the hand, and probably a rotor shape for this forearm right here. But whenever this happens, whoops, get the X, there we go. Um, oh, that wasn't the X, there we go, okay. So um, whenever this happens, again, you might want to pause that and then just kind of adjust uh, this shape. And um, see here, um, the, my arm actually goes way down here. So, you know, maybe uh, um, I should have started in something that shows the entire arm here. But, you know, I can actually get this fairly well, I think, um, moving around down to there. And of course, I want to have my rotor shapes overlap so there's no gap or anything. So let's rotate this a little bit. There we go. And then kind of put that back. Anyway, I think you can see the process here. And I'll have to, I've got enough points I'm working with. I probably don't need more points. But you can add points along the way if it so happens that you need those. Um, the idea is to try and plan it out and understand how many points you need at your most complex shape and then kind of work back from there. But you can add that point as it goes along. So there we go. And uh, just to kind of keep this going, we should probably speed up this process so that you can, uh, we can, we can see more of what's happening here and not have it take too long. But what I'm hoping is that you can, you can see this, you know, point by point kind of meticulous process is what you need to do to get consistent and uh, an accurate roto here.
But the main thing I'm trying to stress is that the tracking in AE, or really any dedicated um, rotoscoping program, is what's really going to, to um, help you along and uh, hopefully you know, do a lot of the work for you. So let's kind of speed this up and rush through it and uh, jump more to a more, uh, more completed version of this project. Okay, if only uh, real roto were that quick. So we can see that I've jumped ahead here and I've got a lot of roto shapes happening in uh, my, my project here. And if you click on each one, I've got all these layers. I haven't colorized them, but I've named them. And so you can see that I'm making these various uh, um, various ones, uh, shapes for each moving uh, part of the, the figure. And um, all the keyframes that I'm having to, to use here. So let's just kind of um, uh, work our way uh, through this. Um, just kind of play it. And we can see it animating and moving around there. Let me uh, click off that one. There we go. So we can see all that kind of going along. And most of my movement stuff is happening here toward the beginning, right? So I've got all these shapes happening. There's that sort of page curl. And we've got stuff going on. And then you can see that for, at, at some point, we don't really need some shapes, right? If you look at this hand right here. So there's the hand. And the hand is going up. And then it's just still kind of hanging around, even though we don't need it. We've got all these other shapes that should be taking care of that. Well, I mean, that's that might not be a problem. Or, you know, it, it might be. So let's just show you some things you can do with that uh, if you want to. So I'm going to click on this hand. There we go. And um, do my command uh, down, down. So now we're on the first, uh, uh, first uh, frame here, the first keyframe. I'll zoom in a little bit on that and show you something that you can do here. So I'm on the hand. And um, I'm going to just kind of go up with keyframe. So command up, arrow key, command up. And now, of course, we get a whole bunch where it's changing shape and every key is a keyframe. So I'll just kind of go forward and it goes like that. And OK, now we're there, right? So we have one keyframe here and one keyframe here. And now it just sort of sits there. So I really don't need it to be hanging around. Uh, because I've got these other ones, the, the main arm, which I uh, uh, apparently called shoulder. Anyway, I've got all this taking this up, and this you know could get in the way. So what I can do is this. I'm on this uh, hand layer, our hand for right hand. And I'm going to click on this option here for my layers, and I'm going to say deactivate layer at current frame. Okay, now it's deactivated. means it's gone away. Now if I go back one frame, look, it's still gone. So that's kind of weird, but what you have to do is you have to come here back to this option and you have to say activate layer at current frame. There we go. So what we can see then is that as I'm going along like this, there it is, there's my rotor shape. And there we go. Oh, and then it goes away when I don't want it to happen. When I'm done with it, it can just deactivate and go away. Now, if I were to have need of it again, I could activate it again as I'm going along through here. And I'm just hitting my um, command and right arrow key to go through to this end and see how it's working. But I don't need that shape anymore. So I could just, you know, deactivate it and keep it deactivated. So that's a handy thing to do when you have shapes that you aren't really uh, needing. So let's um, take a look at some more here. Um, maybe a page. So I've got this page shape. All right, so there's the page. Let's go down to our first keyframe here. OK, now as we go back, you can see I don't really need this at all because I've, I've got other stuff happening here. It kind of looks to me like I, I might not need that shape. So what I could do is I could, um, uh, let me go forward. I'm going to go forward here. And obviously, we want to have it you know, right there, right? That's where it needs to be. Um, we really need it there, but I can kind of keep it right here. I've got a keyframe there anyway. So I could come to the same option, and I'm going to go back one more frame. I'm going to deactivate at current frame. And I'll go forward, and I will activate at current frame. So now we can see that this page um, shape or layer 
isn't there at all until there we go. So now it comes in and now that's where I actually need an animating up right there. And then it goes up and you know, maybe we don't really need it past right there. So then what I could do is maybe right there I will deactivate layer at current frame. So you can see you can have these roto shapes or layers pop in when you need them to and then just um, pop out or deactivate when you don't need them anymore. Okay, so that's a handy little feature uh, right there. Now I want to show you um, just a few ways that you can, can look at things here. I'm going to zoom out just a bit. Notice that we've been doing all this work here. I've been demonstrating it in this um, Essentials um, uh, workspace. Well, <clears throat> if you look at the, uh, at the options here for your workspace, there's Roto. Well, since we're doing Roto, we might actually want to use that. The Essentials is, is doing it for us. But let's see what Roto does. If I go down here, we get a lot more controls. And some things have uh, shifted here. So as I look down here, I can say, okay, I've got more play controls, uh, which is nice. And then also I've got here my tracking controls. And the one thing I do like about this one is we've seen like before in the essentials, there's track backward and track forward, but we also have track one frame at a time and track backward one frame at a time. So those can be, can be really uh, essential and, and helpful as well. Um, okay. So anyway, got some of our same options right here. And I want to show some display options that we have. So one thing that we have is this, by default, we have the, um, these handles turned on. I can click there and say those handles kind of turn off if you don't want to see those, all right? And we'll keep those on, that's fine. And um, then we can just sort of uh, play through, there we go, play through and see how the shapes are, are, are working and animating, but this doesn't exactly tell you what you need to know. So if I come here to some other options, I've got some things here, and um, here's one that says uh, uh, auto alpha. Okay, we'll keep that. The source doesn't have any, any alpha in it, the source being the video footage, so we're gonna ignore that. And I wanna hit this one right here. I wanna do all mats, not selected mats or track mats, but do all mats. Okay, so what I can do then is if I click an option right here, there we go. I can actually have this background removed and it's showing me what I'm rotoing. So I can play through it and see how it's working. Oh, and I see some problems there. Did you catch that? I've got some little gaps. And when you have all these shapes working together, you can have little gaps. Let me uh, deselect uh, this one uh, layer. There we go. So you can see, um, you can see a nice um, bit of animation of your shapes and how they're cropping everything out of the background there. And it shows you if you have any little problems here, like, Yep, I've, I see a little gap there. There's another option you can click right here, which is to turn off your lines. So if I turn off show layer outlines, now I can see a really nice representation of my roto shapes and see where there's some, might be some gap problems. You can see from this point that, you know, if, if your, your edges are good, and if they're nice and smooth, but you can also see there's no feathering or softening at all. So here within Mocha, all you get is just this hard edge. That's fine, that's all we need for right now. So I'm gonna turn my outlines back on and look to see where I have some problems. Okay, I saw a little gap there, so let me um, go forward to uh, right there. So um, what's causing this gap? Well, we can zoom in a little bit and see maybe this uh, shape right here, that's my page corner, um, maybe I need to take it down. So um, if I go back one frame, we're good. I go forward one frame, yeah, there we go. So let's come to right here where it happens and uh, I'll just pull this corner down and cover that up. And now we can go forward and see, are we good with that gap? Oh, well we're good here, but I saw a little gap right here. Now let's go back here to, I'm gonna say that one probably should be the arm or the shoulder is what I called that one, right? So that's my shoulder here. So um, let's look at the keyframes. There's a keyframe where it's really not long enough. So I'm just going to, uh, uh, well, let's see. If I pull this one down here, what will happen is that might mess up this edge. So I think another way I could do this is perhaps use a different shape to do that. 
So what shape would fill this gap? I've got this one here, which is my uh, book edge. And so um, it would really help if I had a point right there, which I don't. So let's just grab my um, additional point tool here, and we'll add a point right there. And now I can just pull that in. And then hopefully, I'll pull that in right there as well, just to make sure. You can see how I'm going frame by frame, it's, um, it's not um, changing previous keyframes. But that's okay here, so let's just kind of move along. Oh, I saw another gap. And there we go, because it's all kind of keyframes. I have to change every keyframe. Unless I click this button here, which is Uber keyframes, means if I change that, if I click this button, and then I pull this frame, uh, this one point out here, it'll do that for all the, uh, the, the keyframes that you have. And that actually might be uh, an okay idea. But in this case, you know, I think um, because I don't really have to be very accurate, I'm just trying to, to close up this gap, I think we're okay. Anyway, um, any other little gaps here? Let's turn off uh, my, my edges and just see what we, what we have like that. Now, I'm really not worried about things like this because I've already got this edge defined right here. So as I look right here, okay, let's uh, turn our, our, okay. What am I gonna do for this one? I think maybe this layer, there's my side, um, that one should should fix that this uh, little gap there. Okay, so this is the, um, oh, that's my, my side of, of the girl here, okay. So if we uh, just kind of move forward here, and let's just kind of pull this out. You can see very nicely covering that gap there. Let's kind of go back, make sure I'm not messing anything up. Oh, uh, I think that's okay. That might be a bit much. Let me kind of pull that one in there a little bit. I'll double check that with the background. Okay. I uh, see that's a problem definitely right there. So I'm gonna have to pull that in. And you can see I'm having to make some uh, some kind of some final adjustments here as well. And I can see a problem with this shape as well. So again, I want to have this nice gap right here. Um, okay, so I'm going to have to pull this in. Again, we want to keep keep that little gap there under the armpit. That one actually went in too far. That's kind of why that happened. Okay. So let's kind of keep moving here. Make sure we don't have gaps. We'll turn off my outlines. We'll zoom out a little bit. There we go. So this is where you get some really kind of fine tuning and you have to look and be very careful to see if there's not some little problem happening. Oh, another little problem right there. So let's turn on our outlines and what might solve that problem? Um, you know, I could just take this, um, uh, again, I could pull down these points here of the arm. The arm really should have gone all the way down, but then that might mess up this line. So uh, it, there's, it's less crucial here, so I'll just kind of pull that one in like that. There we go. So I get a lot of overlap here, more overlap than I need, but you know, we're okay there. Okay, so you can see all those little gap problems are being solved now. I think so. Once again, I'll uh, turn off the outlines and just kind of play through and take a look. Oh, well, that's interesting. We have something there near the end. So what we have there is our side. Yep, that's the side. And so yeah, it's not moving a whole lot, so we're okay there. And as we get this gap there's our biggest gap, I think. I'll just kind of pull these lines in like that and make sure that looks okay there. Yep, not causing any problems there. And that keeps that gap from appearing. Okay. Well, you know, there's always an opportunity you might need to come in and touch up some things uh, more, but I think you get this idea here. So I want to show you a few other things here I'll, uh, you can do. Um, we'll, again, click off so I have my layers deselected. And just show you these um, few things here. So here that was button, you can actually see this one is to um, 
colorize layer mats. And so you have this translucent color. The default is white, and you can see everything now is, is kind of tinted white. So if I turn off my, out, my outlines, you can see that sort of thing happening right along there. So it's just another way to check your rotoscoping work and see if it's, uh, if it's done, if it's done right, if it looks okay. Well, I saw a little something right there, and that uh, made me a little bit bothered. Okay, it's so a little problem right there, I saw. So um, it's just, uh, just really, really important to come through and, and double check all these kinds of issues. So as I'm gonna go forward here, there's like a little gap. So if you think this is tedious, well, you know, it can be, but that's part of the job, right? Okay, so there we go. So it's a little bit right there where I'm kind of missing that finger, and so I, I, I neglected to grab that. So let's grab the uh, hand one. I think what that really means is that I just need to, um, if I move forward to the first keyframe of the hand, let's see right there, okay. Um, what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna take and see where this needs to go. Okay, so that's right there with the hand. So I'm just going to pull that out kind of right there. Go down to the keyframe, kind of pull that out there. And what I'm just trying to do is make sure I close up that tiny little gap that was sort of, uh, of appearing right there. And that's a minor thing, but I just want to make sure that it is taken care of. And there it is, right about there. Okay. Um, so I can click this button again to, uh, as far as colorizing the layers. I see that one. I can click this one to not show the layer mats. Now I see the background. And uh, just kind of want to check a few things here. Um, I'm looking at this side because I had made some changes uh, to this, um, this bit right here. And I just want to make sure that it's uh, kind of looking, looking okay and I didn't get too much of that background in. So I want you to pull that in. Yeah, about like that, I think would be good. Okay, so the joy of rotoscoping. All right, so now we've got a pretty decent set of mats here, it would seem. I've, I've, I've looked at it, I've animated it, I've made some final adjustments, I've fixed some problems, and I think we can see that it's, it's all kind of looking good. There's this nice natural movement, everything flows nicely, and I've got it going. So now that you have these mats done, well, what do you do? Good question there. So you can, of course, uh, save it. You can um, save this project, and uh, it makes a little file called uh, Mocha. But mainly, remember, it's going to be inside your uh, After Effects file. So as long as you save it here and you're going to save your After Effects file, it's all self-contained. So when you're done here and you say, okay, I'm done, I'm done rotoing, now it's time to actually get into my compositing um, part of it, we're going to close uh, the, plug the plugin. And now we're back here in, um, in After Effects. Even though you're not really seeing anything yet, um, what's happening is that it has, um, this is an effect, right? This um, Mocha plugin is on this layer as an effect. And it's not doing anything yet until you tell it what to do. So let's try a few things here. You'll see that under your, um, this is the button we used was launch Mocha. And below that, we've got two items here. We've got tracking data, which we aren't pulling tracking data from, uh, from Mocha. We're just making having make mats. So it'll it'll do the rotoscoping and it'll do some tracking as well. That's a whole different uh, topic there. So if I open up my mats, I can click here to view the mat. And there my mats are. Okay. So we can even kind of play it um, here. I'll I'll go here and just kind of play that. Let's play through this and take a look and, and see 
how the mats look. Um, we've already seen it within, um, within Mocha. Now we're seeing it um, as just standard black and white mats within After Effects. And so this is all looking pretty good. Was there a little gap there? I, anyway, easy enough to, to fix that, something like that in here, because I'm really kind of concerned about the, the edges. So just to show you, you can, you can play it and see it. Also notice how much more quickly and more efficiently that Mocha um, plays and, and shows your, your animating mats than After Effects can. But anyway, let's we'll kind of play it through here, and it's looking okay. I missed a little something there, but that can easily be fixed right there. So um, you can take and you can apply the mat. Let's turn off view mat, and you can apply the mat. What happens if I apply mat, and that's what I get, right? And I probably should have just done this first. And this orange is just the background color of this composition. So you can see I've applied the mat, and you play through it, and um, yeah, it's, it's looking okay. And you can see there's a feather option. Now right here it's feathered to um, to two pixels, and you might think, well, that's that's good. Of course, it's nice you can feather it, and this um, this feathering here is going to um, apply to to all of um, all the the masks or the roto sh the shapes or layers from from Mocha. So we can see there we go. It's looking all right. And uh, which ones are we using? We're using visible layers, but you can kind of adjust that. And, and I've clicked on this Visible Layers button and choose which layers to apply uh, mats from uh, here in After Effects. Um, the problem here, though, is that with this feather, it's universal. All these roto layers are working together as one mat, right? Here's our mat, but we also have a mask. And we know that in After Effects, that's a little bit of a different thing. A mat is, is making transparency from uh, a, a grayscale uh, image or footage, and a mask is the actual um, vector shape. So as you apply this feather, and I'm going to zoom in here and take a look at this, and we can actually see, as I apply this feather, I can see it get more and more feathered. Obviously 17 is, is way too much, and you always want to feather your, your, your uh, rotor shape somewhat, but can you see the problem? Not everything has the same um, level of, of uh, blur or sharpness at the edge. You can see that this page right here is very kind of out of focus and blurry because it be, and even the finger which is right at it, you see that? That's kind of out of focus right there but right here the edge of the arm is very much in focus. So there is no um, feather option that I could set that would work for all of this because all the roto layers are going to get the exact same amount. So um, I think this idea of applying a mat from uh, Mocha is just not that useful. I, there you know, might be some instances, but if you're dealing with motion and motion blur and any type of, of focus issue, it's going to be difficult to have all your rotor shapes be exactly the same amount of feather. So this apply mat is not that useful. I'm going to uncheck that and um, we want to kind of go back to, to normal. So After Effects is thinking here. That's nice. So instead of apply mat, what I want to do is come down here and I want to create AE masks. That's really the real key because that gives you the most control. So let's just click that button instead and see what that does. I've created them, creating the AE masks, and look what we have. Aha. I'll give us a little more uh, view here of our layers. Every um, Roto layer from Mocha is now a mask, a vector mask in After Effects. And notice that regardless of how many keyframes that we had in, in Mocha, as you take and you, you make a, um, a layer mask, um, every frame is a keyframe. So if I click on something, um, let's click on my layer. There we go. So you want to click on, on uh, up, there's the button I need. That's what I'm looking for. That's what we're expecting to see, right? So these are all the masks that um, uh, I made uh, rotoing in, um, in Mocha AE, right? And so I can click on each one, and because every frame is a keyframe, I can't really do any animating at all in After Effects. So you, just, you, just, you don't want to do that because 
um, you know, I could adjust this, you know, mask path, but on this one keyframe, but then now it's wrong for this key, this keyframe and this keyframe. So basically, all you can do though, what you'd want to, if I come here to say my um, uh, page corner, if I open up that, I could take mask feather and really crank up the mask feather on that. So as I crank that mask feather up, and I could zoom in and see how that looks. I can get a really soft edge there, right, for that mask feather. I can even do a couple of things, like for example, mask exp expansion if I needed to, right? So um, there's my mask expansion. I'm adjusting that mask expansion. I'm hoping that I wouldn't really have to do that. Notice as I expand it, I'm getting some background in there. So I probably don't want to really expand it. Of course, if you go negative, you can contract it. See that? I mean, pretty cool. But if you've done your rotoing right, you really don't need to do any mask expansion. But the nice thing is you can adjust and kind of fine tune the amount of feather that you want uh, for these for these shapes right here. And this one, because it is so uh, so soft and, and feathered, that edge, yeah, I might want to even try and expand it out just a little bit. So you can see if I go maybe to, I've expanded it maybe three pixels with a soft uh, mask feather edge of seven. Now that maybe kind of works there. But because this is a separate mask, then I can come to, say, this um, shoulder one. I can open up its feather and give it maybe, you know, a feather of one. Everything needs a little bit of feather. So that feather of one there, that's looking pretty good. Let's just, just as a comparison, uh, we'll take a look here. Let's get this side and maybe give that side, there's my side, open that up and also give that um, a mask feather of, say, one. Now, if we look at this edge, look what I get there. I get a nice little bit of feather there and there, and now I've got that really soft edge for that, uh, that page turn, so that um, it works together as it should, and we get different levels of sharpness along the edges as you would want to, to be able to have. So that right there is looking pretty good, and I'm thinking that for the size of this image and uh, for this normal in-focus edge, it looks like that one pixel feather is going to work. So you can see there's the one pixel feather right there, and there's the unfeathered one. Really needs that same amount. But again, the nice thing if we look at this, at this um, edge of this paper, which is closer, and the depth of field is fairly narrow, so it's kind of out of focus, you can see we have this much softer edge here versus this sharper edge there. That is why when you um, uh, do your rotoing in, in Mocha, Mocha AE, which is probably a better idea than rotoing straight in After Effects, you want to use Create AE Masks because then you have this option, as I mentioned in a previous tutorial, that you can uh, adjust each mask feather individually and even animate that mask feather if you're trying to suggest um, change in depth of field or even motion blur you can do it this way. But having each roto layer be a separate mask in After Effects really is the way to go. You do need that amount of control for professional results. Okay, I hope that you've liked this and it's been useful. Um, use it in your next roto project and um, may all your rotos be quick and easy. Until next time.